Thank you for joining us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. I'm host Carrie Freeman coming to you from Atlanta in January of 2021. And today we're going to be talking about a manifesto for animals, supported by a coalition of 150 animal and environmental NGOs worldwide, organized by World Animal Net. To instruct world leaders on the ways that our mistreatment of non-human animals is the cause of the COVID crisis, and animal protection is also a big part of the solution. The subtitle for this animal's manifesto is A Call to Build Forward to Create a More Sustainable, Equitable, and Humane World and Prevent the Next Pandemic. Let me tell you more about our guest, Jessica Bridgers from World Animal Net. World Animal Net's mission is to improve the status and welfare of animals worldwide by offering information, expertise, and new opportunities to connect, collaborate, and campaign for change. They specialize in improving communication and coordination among the world's animal protection groups. Today, World Animal Net is the world's largest network of animal protection societies with over 3,000 affiliates in more than 100 countries. Their staff works from offices in the UK, the Netherlands, the USA, and South Africa. Their website is where you can read the Animals Manifesto, worldanimals.net. Our guest today is Jessica Bridgers. Jessica is the Executive Director at World Animal Net having received a bachelor's in biology with minors in chemistry and anthropology from the University of New Mexico, she combines a scientific background with a passion for animal protection. She completed her master's in animals and public policy from Tufts University and internships with the Humane Society International, Animal Protection of New Mexico, and the New England Anti-Vivisection Society before arriving at World Animal Net. In her free time, she volunteers with horse and wildlife rescues and makes delicious vegan food. Sounds great. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks, Carrie. It's really great to be here. Uh, Jessica, tell us how the Animals Manifesto got started in terms of the need for it and how you got organizations involved. Sure. So yeah, since 2014, World Animal Net has hosted a group called the International Policy Forum. And that's been a, <clears throat> a platform for policy experts from about 22 animal protection organizations and, and representing every region of the world to come together and share information and collaborate on advocacy um, opportunities. And so in the wake of COVID-19 last spring, the IPF asked us if we could have a special meeting on how the animal protection organizations that are members of this group could um, build a joint you know, response to the, to the crisis. Good. And, so what came out of that meeting was that we needed a, a, a joint manifesto. And just to back up for a minute, because I'm an American and I think most of um, the listeners are also in the US, manifesto wasn't necessarily my first um, uh, first choice for what we would call it. can sound like the Unabomber also <laughs> manifesto, yeah. but I get that yeah. yours is a good one. It's, it's yeah. peaceful. Sure. Yeah. And it's, yeah. So it's, it's definitely a, a word that has a lot of connota connotations <laughs> in our country, but in a global context, it's used much more frequently. And okay. Yeah. Like in the UK, political parties will use it the way that like Democrats and Republicans have a, a party platform that they publish. Yeah. It's like a read. declaration. Yeah. So it's just a, a, a list of, you know, policy proposals that we have for policymakers. Um, so with that, past us. Um, yeah. So we kicked off the process. Um, I put together a thought starter and tried to kind of lay out the basic structure and tone. And then we had the members do really all of the drafting. So we had veterinarians and scientists and policy experts and issue experts filling in, um, you know, what were the main asks we want and um, fact checking. So I think that's, that's how it became such a strong document is it had so much input um, from experts across a lot of different fields and issues. And, who, um, and we were really able to, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, who are some of, besides uh, the experts or where do some of them work? Like, what are some of the organizations that maybe that people might recognize? I know you can't list all 150 right now, but. Sure. So yeah, from the IPF, so everyone in the IPF represents themselves and not their organization, but we do oh, okay. have um, people from like Human Society International and World Animal Protection. So those are some of the bigger ones. And then we have like regional um, and national organizations from, yeah, we have Animals Australia. Um, so yeah, so there's, yeah, I, I don't wanna list everyone. Right, yeah, but, um, and it's from over a hundred yeah, nations, which is fantastic. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we had the kind of a final draft, we started, so the, I, I just want to be more clear that the drafting was, um, through our international policy forum. So there was like 22 organizations okay. that were more involved in that more closely involved in like the, you know, really nitty gritty of the content. And then once we had a draft that we were, you know, broadly happy with, and we started sharing out towards how to we get, got to that. Like yeah, signatories. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. There can't so be too many cooks in the and... kitchen. Already having 22 <laughs> groups is <laughs> a lot to put together something where they all agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and yeah, so we launched it originally on World Animal Day, which is October 4th. And at that point, we only had, um, I think, 70 supporting organizations. And then after that, through the course of the fall, we actually, as of this week, we have 170 Whoa, um, yeah. And yeah, and then most excitingly in November, Jane Goodall um, yes. endorsed the manifesto and provided a forward that we were able to. I was going to say, I thought, wow, <laughs> there's a nice, a really nice detailed opening letter from Dr. Jane Goodall. So yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this at the end, but who were you writing the manifesto for in terms of like the policy recommendations? Who, who's supposed to heed this advice? Yeah, so we are primarily targeting the manifesto towards international policymakers. Um, okay. So animal welfare is really not addressed well in international policy right now. So the World right. Organization for Animal Health has developed animal welfare standards, which cover some farm animals and 182 countries have agreed to implement those, but they're not binding and they're at a much lower level than most of us would really like. And, and there's a lot of gaps. Um, but besides that, um, the UN really doesn't address animal welfare ever. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN sometimes does, but not in a very strong way. So it's, despite the fact that they don't really address it, it's, it's really linked to some of the major challenges that we're facing. So biodiversity loss, climate change, deforestation are all really linked to, um, you know, our use of wildlife and also how we've um, farm our food. And so it's really an issue that that does deserve um, to be heard and even without the context of COVID. But I think, um, you know, recognizing the devastation that COVID has caused, it's also created the opportunity for new dialogues because people are now talking about building back better or building forward and yeah. have much more awareness about how animal health is linked to our own health. And so with that in Absolutely. mind, we wanted to, yeah, so we wanted to um, create a tool that animal protection organizations can use to influence um, the people who represent their country at the international level. So like permanent representatives to the UN, UN resident coordinators who are responsible for leading the UN teams in country um, and national focal points for you know, different processes, which a focal point is just the person that's responsible for like, you know, coordinating, but also receiving input from the public. Um, so like the Convention on Biological Diversity has these. So yeah, those are kind of who we are, right. yeah, trying to um, get this message to. And, and the main thing I think too that I wanna highlight is that we don't wanna be an organization in the global North um, telling mm -hmm. policymakers in the global South uh, what policies we want. We want to really be able to pull from the animal protection movement all, all around the world and create a common you know, position that then local animal protection organizations can use to talk to their own representatives. Yeah, so I like that, like that democratic spirit <laughs> that you have <laughs> um, and, and very collaborative um, and not kind of top down um, with any kind of hierarchy, putting the United States at the top or something like that. Yeah, so I, I think I like the fairness <laughs> there. Let me highlight some of the main recommendations in the Animals Manifesto, and then we can talk about a few of them. Okay, so it says through a new manifesto, the NGOs outline key policies and actions required to, and then these are kind of the areas, transform farming systems, shift food consumption habits, end the unnecessary exploitation of wildlife, increase vaccine development efficiencies, and ensure the well-being of animals and communities such as companion animals and working equines. So let's start with you sharing some of the manifesto's recommendations for changing food, food consumption and, and farming. Sure. So I would just start with like a bit of context of um, 
you know, how we selected the, these issues. So obviously these are ones that, you know, we have long seen as, as major risks um, for, uh, you know, future pandemics and have been warning about. But yes. um, it, so in July, there was actually a really important report from UN Environment and the International Livestock Research Institute that highlighted seven of the key risk factors for future um, pandemics. And actually the first three were increasing demand for meat and mm. and second was industrial farming and the third was um, exploitation of wildlife right. and so we chose those three and then we added um, the vaccine efficiencies because there's a lot of duplication in animal research that is unnecessary and so this is obviously a problem in the context of right. COVID. Sure and then also how animals and communities have been um, yeah it, the restrictions and shutdowns have restricted the care that goes to those animals. Oh, but okay. so that's why yeah. they were included. Um, but yeah, so coming back to food and farming, um, since you know the UNEP report highlighted increasing demand for meat and industrial farming. So the demand for meat is actually a huge problem globally for, you know, it's it's one of the leading causes of biodiversity loss and it's a huge contributor to climate change. Um, and in fact, uh, humans account for only 36% of the biomass of mammals, and then wild mammals account for 4%, but 60% is actually domesticated livestock. Oh my gosh, and I know, that's <laughs> terrible. How, so, like what we have done to change the whole dynamic of who's on this planet exactly. by just breeding animals for our consumption and murdering them and mass producing them. Ugh. Yeah, right. powerful statistic, go ahead. Yeah, right. so I mean, and a lot of people aren't aware of this because they never see it in their day to day life. So because we are trying to produce so many animals, we have to, you know, raise them in very factory like conditions yeah. that are very cramped and unhygienic. We use a huge amount of antibiotics just to keep them healthy through the course of their um, short lives. And it's a huge source of pollution and um, a huge risk for zoonotic disease, obviously. So um, this is the reason we chose to look at this. And um, so we looked at both the consumption and production sides. And so trying to change consumption patterns towards less um, animal heavy diets. Right. Um, so we recommended to that policymakers look at the Eat Lancet Commission report, um, which is a report that came out a few years ago now. Um, which yeah, I've to... covered that on this show, the um, EAT you. Lancet yeah, report on like sustainable food. Because exactly. yeah, it's very recommends plant-based diets for the most part. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean to to try to find that sweet spot between healthy and, and sustainable diets, it's it has to be lower in animal products. So and in order to achieve that, because those sorts of diets are not affordable for most of the world's population, we really have to start changing um, the way we uh, have our tax and subsidy architectures for food systems. So right now, um, meat and dairy products are in many countries much cheaper than, they're artificially cheaper because of the subsidies going into them. Right. Um, so what we need to do is begin to actually tax the products that are less healthy and less sustainable and more of a risk for zoonotic disease. Um, mm. So taxes on meat. Yeah. Um, which is something that has actually been, you know, discussed by the EU and some um, the International Food Policy Research Institute has done some work on that as well. And then we need to be providing subsidies towards healthy foods. So we have to just make those diets easier for people to, um, you know, choose on a day to day basis. And we also need to increase our education and awareness programs and pair that with um, labeling schemes so that people have the knowledge to make good decisions. And they can also tell easily and transparently which products help them um, make, you know, those purchases. Um, right. Yeah, and then we need to increase investment in plant-based alternatives to make those more affordable and more widespread. Um, and we also need to set standards for public procurement. So that's like when the U.S., you know, um, sources food for the uh, national lunch program, for example. Right. Setting standards for that makes a huge difference in, you know, how what's normalized in terms of where food and how food is produced and right. then for yeah so and then for on farms we would like to see uh, reduced stocking densities and eliminating the use of cages and crates um, and instead ensuring that when livestock are farmed that uh, the conditions on the farms are better so that animals have adequate space to engage their natural behaviors 
um, that the farms address species specific needs, um, that they reduce stress levels, which can actually cause weakened immune systems. And that puts, you know, more risk of zoonotic disease right. outbreaks and spillover. Um, and we need to end the need for routine mutilations like tail docking and castration Ugh. and beaking, which are yes. usually, yes, done without pain management and just all around ensure that animals are healthier and that will greatly reduce our, um, you know, our risk and also improve their welfare. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah, so ending prophylactic use of antimicrobials and then shifting towards more regenerative agriculture that's better for soil and contributes to biodiversity. So that's kind of in a nutshell, decrease the number of animals that we're farming. And then with any remaining farming that's happening, we need to really adhere to one health and one welfare principles. And yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned one health and one welfare. I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. I just want to uh, say if you're just joining us on Radio Free Georgia, this is In Tune to Nature, and I'm host Carrie Freeman interviewing Jessica Bridgers, Executive Director of World Animal Net, who coordinated a coalition of 150 eco and animal NGOs globally to publish the Animals Manifesto report in October 2020, a call to build forward to create a more sustainable, equitable, and humane world and prevent the next pandemic. The Animals Manifesto is found at the website worldanimal.net. Jessica, you, you talk, you mentioned about incorporating one health and one welfare into policies. Most of us probably are not familiar with that. Could you briefly tell us what one health and one welfare means? Sure. So I'll start with one health. Um, so one health is kind of a transdisciplinary approach that tries to understand the links between human, environmental, and animal health, and then try to find solutions which improve health outcomes. So it takes for, a very for all across, like across, you know, yeah. all species is what you mean. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah, so it takes a very preventative approach and it, it's something that's been recognized by the World Health Organization for many years, um, but it hasn't been very prominent in policymaking. Um, but it is a good tool for addressing zoonotic diseases and antimicrobial resistance, um, which negative, negatively impact human health, but originate from the ways that we choose to use animals. Um, yeah. But in the wake of COVID, it's been taken up by a lot more, uh, you know, policymaking institutions, at least globally. Um, it's limitation is that it's very technical and that it doesn't really address animal welfare and it really looks narrowly at just health issues. So what one welfare adds is that it, it still focuses on animals, humans, and the environment, but it takes a more holistic approach. I mean, COVID impacted livelihoods, it impacted our economies, like it had a lot of knock on effects that weren't just related to health. And yeah. so it's, yeah, so with one welfare, it gives us kind of a more, a better tool set, I, I would say, um, for addressing some of the issues that we're facing. Um, so like food security and livelihoods, climate change, it, it gives us a better tool. And it also ensures that animal welfare isn't overlooked. Um, the downside right. is that it's much newer and it has a, a smaller academic, you know, research base that underpins it. Mm -hmm. So our goal is really to try now that policymakers, which is good, have a better understanding of one welfare or sorry, one health and why, you know, it can be an important tool. Um, we're trying to also educate them on one welfare and, and how it's, you know, it extends and is potentially more useful. Um, wow. Yeah, I, I love the holistic approach. Well, we're going to be wrapping up soon, but I wanted to just say, has there been any response or have you, no, has there been any influence um, yet in terms of the Animals Manifesto in, in any of the um, global organizations responding to the report? So I would just say we're still really early on actually okay. in, in, in sharing it, um, you know, most of the uh, up until December, really, we were still kind of trying to get more support from okay, get get more people in the yeah. co coalitions and then uh, send it out. Okay. Yeah. So the one main thing that um, we did have time to do before you know the holidays started and everything kind of came to an end. Right. There, there was a a, a UN General Assembly special session on COVID. Um, in early December. And so we were able to get really good visibility for the document on Twitter. Um, so for most of these UN meetings, there'll be a hashtag for the um, event. And when you look at that hashtag, you'll see like delegates and ambassadors and 
um, leaders of different institutions sharing their perspective and making statements. And so we were able to, with the um, organizations that signed on, um, kind of retweeting and liking each other's posts, we were able to get it really high um, oh, on that wow. feed for Great. you know most of those the days that that meeting took place. So that was very good, and I think you know hopefully it's been seen. But in general, we still. Um, I think the the year ahead will be a lot busier for actually getting it to policymakers. So last year, a lot of major negotiations were postponed because of COVID, and now they've been stacked on top of what was supposed to already happen this year, which was already a lot. So yeah. um, the next couple of months will obviously be quiet, but towards the end of the year and in early 2022, there's going to be major conferences on the environment, on biodiversity, food systems, and climate change. So there's going to be a lot of a lot hey, of opportunities. Yeah, I'm so glad, yeah, <laughs> that you're going to be ready and that you did this work now to say, like, uh, the way we treat animals has been a part of this massive problem, along with extinction and climate change and all these other problems. And you know, so this has to be thought of in the solution. Plus, is just the right thing to do. So yeah. I think it's fantastic. Now, how could our any interested listeners help circulate the animals manifesto, and maybe who should they send it to if they were interested? Sure. So the best way, um, the best option for sharing it is to use a bit.ly link that we've created. So it's bit.ly backslash animals manifesto. And that oh, can you will... repeat that? B sure. B-I-T-L-Y. Yeah. B-I-T.L-Y backslash animals manifesto. And yeah, so that will take people to the page that has the, it's, it's a PDF essentially, but this link is always updated with new signers. And so we, we oh, haven't nice. had a cutoff date. Yeah. So I don't want to like circulate too many PDFs of it, that you know, are going to be out of date as more people join. So. Cause um, I went to world, like worldanimals.net and then kind of linked to it on your website. So that, is that another way that works too? Yeah, we'll, um, yes, that one links okay. also to the same bit.ly link. Okay. So that one is the one that's always going to be updated. Um, yeah, so that should be fine too. Um, yeah, and so. Then, and if they were going to send it, like, should they send it um, to like the, um, their state department of, uh, or um, like to the, the president of their nation or. So yeah, the State Department should be fine. If they, um, we actually have um, for our many, many countries, we've actually tracked down the contact details. Oh, so okay. if, if people are interested in, in contacting the types of policymakers that we are um, trying to, you know, get this message out to, then they could contact us at info at worldanimal.net. And then we can set them up with like sample oh, okay. letters. I and, like that. Info just at worldanimals.net is your email. Yeah. Worldanimal.net. Worldanimal.net. Okay. Yep. And yep. Yep. So yeah, then we can share template letters and, and resources to make that as easy as possible. But in general, I mean, any policymaker that you think is making decisions related to these issues, I mean, this could be- Because even locally, problem. right, like here in yeah. Georgia, where I live, like if we're making decisions about farming, you know, because we're agricultural, you know, then this could apply to that. So, right, it could be people, you know, exactly. that, that you know. But at the back, I noticed at the end, it's a 40-page um document it's got some beautiful pictures in it and but at the end it lists all the the um, global organizations too so people could also go and look at those and you know yes send, yeah you know send it to you know some feedback to those organizations in support if if they are in support of it so exactly yeah. okay that's great yeah. well that's the end of our show but i want to thank you jessica for being with us on radio free georgia's in tune to nature program and and thank you and world animal net for coordinating efforts with so many animal and eco advocacy organizations to ensure that animal protection is a key agenda item in public health efforts well thank you for having me carrie yeah. it's been a pleasure it's been great yeah. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to In Tune to Nature, broadcasting every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time online at wrfg.org and on Atlanta radio station 89.3 FM. We post action items, news, and podcasts on the show's website, facebook.com slash Nature. 
The views and opinions expressed on this show do not necessarily reflect those of WRFG, its board staff, or volunteers. I'm one of those volunteers. I'm host Carrie Freeman, asking you to please support independent, non-commercial media like Radio Free Georgia. And remember to take care of yourself and others, including other species. Thank you for listening. Cheers. <laughs>